أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وأهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي ورواح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم <تصفيق> وراودته التي هو في بيتها عن نفسه وغلقت الابواب وقالت هيت لك قال معاذ الله انه ربي احسن مثواي انه لا يفلح الظالمون The woman in whose house he was sought to seduce him. She firmly locked all of the doors and said, Come. He said, God forbid. Indeed, he is my Lord. He has given me a good abode. Indeed, the oppressors are not successful. So we've reached to a little bit of a dangerous ayat in the, the story of Surah Yusuf. Um, but this is an inspirational part of the story. very inspirational part of the story it shows us the power of taqwa and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can open doors for the mu'minin if they have taqwa they do their responsibility Allah can make miracles happen so it's very inspirational part of the story and we're looking at this verse and the verses of the holy quran for inspiration so that we can prepare ourselves and the world for the return of our imam That's a big request that we're making from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're really asking for something that's great. Let me give you a hadith that helps us understand the thawab that we will get with the return of our imam. If we're able to do something to allow the imam to return. Let's listen to the hadith. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, إِنَّ الْجَهَادِ بَابٌ مِنْ أَبْوَابِ الْجَنَّةِ فَتَحَهُ اللَّهِ لِخَاسَةِ أَوْلِيَائِهِ Amir al-Mu'mineen says that jihad, right, that's what we're asking for with the imam, the return of the imam, that will remove the tawagheet and the tyrants from the face of the earth. We're going to come, I know I'm going to be there, inshallah, you're on, the imam comes. We're asking for the, we're begging Allah for the opportunity to give our lives in the way of Islam, to free mankind, to save humanity, right? the honor of being alongside our imam. So he says that this jihad that you're asking for, the jihad of being alongside your imam and serving your imam, he said this is babun min abwabil jannah. This is a door from the doors to paradise. Allah opens this door li khassati awliya'ih. Only for his special friends does he open that door. So it's a big request that we're making from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're going over these verses of the Holy Quran, these ahadith, is a chance for us to go over ahadith from Ahlul Bayt, Quran and Sunnah, to inspire ourselves, to look for practical ways that we can change. Inspiration, so we can live our own lives better as Muslims. And then after that, Allah see, we're making effort, and say that I will bless them and allow them the presence of their imam. So, let's see what's happening now in the story. What's happening now in the story, remember Yusuf السلام, when he first went to the castle and the palace of the Aziz, he was a young man. We learned in the other verse yesterday that he reached around the age, let's say 18, this age where he came of age. When he came of age, Allah gave him some special divine gifts because of his own spirituality, because of the trait of ihsan, then Allah gave him some special gifts. And then the difficulty started for Yusuf alayhi salam. The woman in whose house he was started to approach him and try to get Yusuf to commit a terrible act. But it wasn't the situation that Yusuf alayhi salam was in wasn't an easy one. Yusuf was naturally attra- he's a man, so men are naturally attracted to women. Okay? Yusuf is a young man around 18 years old, so that's when the shahawat are raising person is naturally attracted. Yusuf also was extraordinarily handsome. 
Yusuf alayhi salam was not just attractive, he was extraordinarily handsome. Let me read you a hadith from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says, U'tiya Yusuf shatr al-husn wa nisf al-akhar li baqi nas Yusuf alayhi salam was given half of the beauty in the world. And the rest of that beauty was divided among all of the rest of Allah's creation. So Yusuf wasn't a normal guy. So Yusuf is there living the life in the palace. And now the verses of the Holy Quran. The woman in whose house he was was trying to seduce him. What we learn is that the, in the Arabic language, when they use the word al murawada, when they say rawad to fulanan an kaza, it's when two people have a different a difference of opinion. For instance, is one of the things that's mentioned in the tafas. I want something. You want something. I work on you to convince you to go my way. I keep talking to you, trying to convince you to go my way. In some of the other books, they say that it's something which is done gently. Gently insisting, mis- mentioning things, saying things, trying to convince the other person to do this. So Yusuf is in the situation, he's in the house, and the woman is insisting and trying to convince him to do something terrible. He came there as a child, but now he's older, and this process is happening. The verse said, if we look at the verse, it says, Hua fi baytiha. He was in her house. Alama Tabatabai, Rudlanullah Ta'ala alayhi says, this is to explain to us how difficult the situation he was in. Yusuf alayhi salam was in her house. She was the princess. She was the wife of the second most powerful man in Egypt. And he's in her house. All of the factors were in, for working for her and against Yusuf. Yusuf is a foreigner. Yusuf is penniless. Yusuf is a slave. Yusuf's owned by them. If Yusuf alayhi salam were to go with her and to submit to her and follow her desires, the dunya would be open for Yusuf. If Yusuf resisted and said, No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not you, not your not my desires. If Allah if he did this, we say in America, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Normally there's consequences. It's not, no, oh, okay, alhamdulillah, go about your business. No. Right? At least the threat of it was there. So from one side, who of that he's in her house, everything's at her disposal, she calls the police or says something or you try to, right? Or on the other side, if she agrees with you, then the dunya is there for you. So, she had been there, and like just so we understand what's happening better, right? He's come there as a small child. This is this is a, um, again, it's inspiration for us to see how taqwa can save us. Right? He's come there as a small child. Let's say eight, nine, ten, whatever age, and he's been raised by the same woman. If we remember the other verses of the Holy Quran, the, her husband, the Aziz, told her to honor him. Verse number 21, Akrimi Mathwa. She told, the Aziz told her to honor him. He said, maybe we're going to take him as a son. Maybe he'll be our heir. right? Maybe we'll benefit from him. Look after him. Take care of him. So now, from that time that he came in, until this time, the wife of the Aziz has been looking after him. Kind to him. Respectful to him. If you need anything, I'll take care of it. Like a precious gem he's been in that house. It's between the lines. It's a little bit more difficult to say no to somebody if they've done you a lot of favors. If somebody's always been kind to you, I've helped you out, I've taken care of you, I've lent you money, this, that, and the other, and then I ask you for a favor. It's not easy to say no. So she spared no effort in this regard. She did. Her husband said to honor him, to take care of him, to look after him, and she did that. So Yusuf has been over there. Now Yusuf, 
When he came into the house from the beginning, they admired Yusuf. They were impressed with Yusuf's character, how he handled himself, his wisdom, kindness, adab, akhlaq. Later on, though, once he became a young man, she fell for him. She fell for him. Now, Yusuf was someone who, even when somebody saw him once, they would fall in love with him. Remember the story of the, the women, right? You've heard the story of Surah Yusuf, that they were talking bad about Zulaikha. Oh, she's so disgusting. She has she fell for her own slave, but they'd never seen Yusuf. So Zulaikha arranged a party. All of them came in the party. They're sitting, enjoying, having fruits. And then told Yusuf to come out. So stunned when they saw Yusuf, we have in some of the tafasir, cutting their own wrists with their knives and couldn't, but weren't even aware of it. He's that good looking, that amazing. So Yusuf is like that. And what happens when you're living every day with Yusuf? Seeing him every, he's such a kind, uh, such a person. If you see him once, you fall in love with him. The adab, the akhlaq, the character, perfect physical specimen. And he's, and now she's living with him every single day. Every day in the evening, morning, and they were constantly together in the castle. In addition to that, what also made the test difficult is that the wife of the Aziz, Zuleikha, was also gorgeous. Zuleikha wasn't ugly. Zuleikha was also very nice. <coughs> Zuleikha is there, amazing to look at. And then when she would be around Yusuf, always tastefully dressed, looking her best, and giving little hints to Yusuf. Indications of what she wants, smiling, whatever, to get him to let him know what she wants from him. So, <clears throat> the verse of the Holy Quran: The woman in whose house he was in tried to seduce him. So she was always promising herself she would get access to Yusuf. She would be able to finally be. She fallen in love with him. At first it started off that she's giving little signals and these things. Um, and she hadn't seen resistance from Yusuf. Meaning, Yusuf was her slave. Up until now, she had, he had never disobeyed her. Right? He had never disobeyed her. She's always been kind to Yusuf. She's always been trying to dress her best, these things. Now she's giving hints and Yusuf wasn't saying anything. Wasn't saying that, get out of my face, you're about... He's a slave, what can he do? It's his master's house. So what happened, she took that as a signal that Yusuf likes me. He's okay with it. So what she did was she finally got him to the room alone. She convinced him to come. With whatever excuse or whatever she made up, now I'll come over and I'll get Yusuf to come to the room where I am. So we'll be alone. The, the verse says, وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبْوَى Bab in Arabic is a door. Abwab are several doors. Abwab. There's a, there's a difference in the Arabic language between ghalq and taghliq. Taghliq, which is what they use over here, is when you go and you firmly lock the doors. Right? So, several things. First, first there were several doors. In our hadith, they say seven doors. So, somehow she convinced him, she got him to come to her innermost chambers, for instance. Made sure nobody else is around. And then just lock the doors, but did taghliq of the doors. Lock the doors firmly so nobody else can get in. And she'd been waiting for this for years. Then she said, وَقَالَتْ talak." She told Yusuf, come. When she closed the doors, now she started to act like a slave and a master. She thought erroneously, her relationship with Yusuf salam, was a relationship between a slave and a master. They own Yusuf, right? They own Yusuf. Yusuf is their property. They can order and command Yusuf to do different things. She thought that that was the actual relationship that she had. That she could order Yusuf and he would obey. Up until now, she hasn't wanted anything. She's been nice, she's been kind. Of course, leading up to this, probably nicer, kinder. right? Everything dressed appropriately. And then now she commanded Yusuf, this is what we find in the tafsir, commanded Yusuf to come. She, in her words, in this sentence, hey, Talak, she has two messages. One of them is that I'm your master, you have to do what I say, you come over and I'm at your service. 
The other one is that I'm ready for you. So she thought that it was, you know, it's all over. No way Yusuf can, so, could resist. I've set the grounds perfectly. I've waited all these years, all these hints. Now I have him in a place, there's nobody else there. And then now I give the command to come. So just before we go on about the, with the rest of the verse, right? Inspiration from the verse. Inspiration from the verse. One thing that we know, 100%, is that men and women shouldn't be friends. Men and women shouldn't be friends. It's different to what the West says. But we don't believe that men and women should be buddies and hang out with one another. And you know, I'm on Facebook and I'm sharing and I'm telling my... She's just like a sister to me. Huh? People tell themselves... I don't, it doesn't feel, I don't feel anything. I'm just talking, it's healthy. Healthy. And really, if somebody doesn't feel anything when they're talking to a non mahram they don't feel any sort of a buzz, really, they, then they need to go see a doctor. So normally, people are attracted to these things. We don't need to um, be friends. Naturally, in, in Islam, we believe that men and women are naturally attracted to one another. And Allah put those desires in us. And that's the right way we should be. We don't believe homosexuality is right. People were made that way. and No, we don't believe any of those lies. Naturally, men and women are attracted to one another. And if they care about one another, they shouldn't be friends with one another. This is one of the areas we want to take ihtiyat on. To do, take precaution. There's a verse of the Holy Quran. Ya ladina amanu khudu hidrakum. O you who believe, take precaution. One of the areas we want to take precaution in is the relationship between men and women. That we don't want to be buddy to buddy. You know, we're just like brother and sister. We're friends. We hang out together. We spend a lot of time together. No, one of the areas we want to be careful about is not that. And spending a lot of time alone together is definitely not right. Definitely something we want to avoid. We have a hadith. This is a, you can say a hadith. It's found in our hadith. It's the advice of shaitan to Musa. Normally we don't listen to the words of shaitan, right? His advice. And he's coming and whispering. But if it's come through this filter, that he's telling a prophet something, narrated in a hadith, then yeah. So what does he say? What's his advice to Musa? He says, Ya Musa. Satan warning Musa. Ya Musa. La takhlu bi imra'atin wa la takhlu bi. Never be alone with a non-mahram and never let her be alone with you. This is what he says. He says, why? فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَخْلُوا رَجُلٌ بِإِمْرَأَةٍ وَلَا تَخْلُوا بِهِ إِلَّا كُنْتُ صَاحِبَهُ مِنْ دُونَ أَصْحَابِي He says that it's never the case. Why shouldn't you ever be alone with a non-mahram? He says, it's never the case that a man is alone with a non-mahram woman, except, he says, I come instead of my companions. He's got little minions who go over and they whisper and stuff too. But Shaitan says, if a man and a woman are alone, I personally come and do the waswasa. Personally. The big guy. Shaitan. So, we want to be real careful about that, about the issue of mahram and non-mahram and staying away from that. Um, and it's not about being suspicious of others either. Sometimes somebody like me will be like, yeah, you know, those horrible sisters, they're going to fool me. And for instance, not sisters, but non-mahrams, Muslim, non-Muslim. But another time, I'm not suspicious of others. I'm not saying everybody else is bad. As a Muslim, I've got a weakness for the opposite gender. Allah put that in me. I'm not broken because I have that. So naturally, I keep myself away from a situation which is inappropriate. Whether I'm married or single. Whether I'm married or single. It's not the case that once we get bigger, once we get married, then alhamdulillah, now I'm safe. No. Being friends with non-mahrams, even after marriage, can help a marriage go to hell. People can slip. We never know. So what we're saying is that we're careful about that even before or even after marriage. We're, we're real careful about that. And what the verse of the Holy Quran says, this is surah number 17 and verse number 32. He says, 
ولا تقرب الزنا انه كان فاحشة وساء سبيلا don't become close to zina right don't like there's steps that people take before that terrible acts happen joking and laughing and playing and these things he says don't even become close to it so anyhow let's stop now and i'm going to say the name of the imam will stand and then we'll come forward inshallah oh am ali muhammad sisters also if you can come forward and then make some room for the people who are in the middle. Bring the microphone. All right. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Allahumma sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad So we started off with that first part of the verse Explaining what Zulaikha did The house alone Dressed herself up And was alone with Yusuf And tells Yusuf to come The point that we want to get from this Before we go on Is that there is an appropriate place For all of these things there's appropriate place for the looks and the whispers and talking and suggesting and being romantic and saying all those nice things, dressing up very tastefully. There's a place for all of that. And that's marriage. That's marriage. In marriage, that should happen. That should take place. Unsuccessful couples, unsuccessful people are those people who after marriage neglect this. There are people who after marriage, they neglect saying these things and being romantic and dressing up tastefully in these things. And that's a big mistake. Even after marriage, all of these things that Zulaikha was doing need to take place. And each one of us, brothers and sisters, mu'minin and mu'minat, the people who want to be the true soldiers of the Mahdi, have a responsibility in this regard. We have a responsibility towards our spouse in this regard. We don't want to, the reason that Allah doesn't set, accept our ibadah and our worship is because we're actually zalim in the house. That my spouse has emotional needs, duties that Allah has placed on my shoulders, and I don't fulfill those because of my own nafs. So the idea of meeting with my spouse, spending time alone, like Zulaikha, spending time alone and with just the husband and wife, that's important. You know, some people actually make the mistake of having their small children sleep in the same room as the parents. No, parents need time alone. Children have their own room. Parents need time alone. So, dressing up, being romantic. The thing is that shaitan, how he works, all guys know how to be romantic. They know how to say things. You ask any guy, take him with an anmahram, he knows all the words and cards and watch how shaitan works. I don't do that with my wife. I know all the words. I know how to say. I know how to say sweet things. It's not that I'm broken. I'm not. But do I say those things on a constant basis? Like Zuleika was always hinting and whispering and dressing and looking. And but for husband and wife, for husband and wife, do we do those things with our spouse on a regular basis? Are we observing their rights? Other point is we don't. Some people wait. They say that I'll wait until my spouse does this. My spouse is not um, doing what's appropriate. They're, you know, after marriage people fall out of love and they're, they're not doing these things that I would like them to do that they fulfilling my emotional needs. So I'll wait. And if they do that, then inshallah I'll do my responsibility. That's different from the soldiers of the imam. The soldiers of the imam do what their responsibility is. Qurbatan illallah. Whether their spouse does it or doesn't do it, reciprocates or doesn't reciprocate, I don't, that's not a concern for me. I have to do what my responsibility is. So that needs to be taking place. The, te- the tasteful dressing that we're talking about, the, about that Zulaikha did, actually we have hadith about that. Hadith about that. That this is from the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. 
He's talking about what the wife should be like in a successful relationship. We talked about the idea of being romantic and spending those time together. These things, the hadith says that it's her duty. Wa alayha an tatayyaba bi atyabi tibiha. It's her duty to wear her best perfume. Wa talbas ahsan thiabaha, thiabaha to wear her best clothing. Wa tazayyan bi ahsan zinatiha to wear her best um, jewelry. وَتَعْرِذْ نَفْسَهَا عَلَيْهِ غُدْوَةً وَعَشِيَّةً And to present herself to her husband morning and evening. So always the story, what Zuleikha was doing wasn't wrong what she was doing, doing it for the wrong person. But otherwise, dressing up and looking good and taking care of oneself, that's actually a responsibility. Being romantic, these things, it shouldn't be the case that God forgive, the mu'mineen are not the people who do this. And my spouse, whether it's a sister who's hearing these words of Qur'an and Sunnah. Or brother, my spouse is love-starved because I don't do my responsibility. It's a, it's a heavy responsibility on us. And if we do that, if we do these instructions of Qur'an and Sunnah, we have hadith that let us know this can help save even a broken marriage. We mentioned one of the, those ahadith. The hadith is talking about a woman who's actually got talaq, she got divorced from her husband. And what should she do in the meantime? She's still in the idda. She's in the waiting period. What should she do in the meantime? We have hadith about this. The mistake that some people make is that they send the spouse to their to their family. So I'll send my spouse to go back and to meet her, to stay with her dad during the waiting period. And then after that, the talaq is over and they go. Actually, that's not correct. The spouse during that time actually has a right to be supported and nafaka and to stay in that same house. During that time, what should they do? We have hadith. That at that time, the woman should wear um, kohal and henna, those are the makeups of those times, put on perfume and wear whatever she wants, hadith. And it says, if she does that, it even at this stage, a broken marriage can be saved by her doing her responsibility. She and the husband fall back in love again, and the marriage is safe. Even that, at that stage. Imagine if this is done consistently. So, what Zulaikha was doing was wrong because of who she was expressing it for. But otherwise, in and of itself, there's an appropriate place for that. So let's go back to the story. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So, Zulaikha thought there was nothing stopping her from getting her request. I've prepared everything. He's a slave. I'm his master. Once I've given that order, it's all over. But what we see is if taqwa happens, something very different happens. Let's look at the words, how Allah records what Yusuf salam said. Qala ma'adallah. Yusuf salam said, God forbid. So she's done all of this hard work, prepared everything, locked the doors, come. Yusuf, what does he say? Qala ma'adallah, God forbid. Now this, this statement itself is actually a very important statement. It's not a simple statement that this Prophet of Allah says. Right? Yusuf alayhi salam, his heart was filled with love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This sentence is a glimpse of the relationship that he had with Allah. That love that was there. What happens is that normally when people go through really difficult times, people go through difficult times, what happens is you see their reactions. I'll give you, let me say it another way. When you surprise someone, a lot of times you'll see what their internal state is. If I'm a cowardly person, let's say, don't ever do this, right? Don't, don't do this at home, right? Don't do this. If you surprise someone, let's say in a dark alley, right? A dark alley, somebody, you don't, you guys don't have that problem here, inshallah, gangsters and this kind of thing. You surprise somebody, you come in a dark alley and you jump out of that person. There's either the flight tendency or the fight tendency. Some people, the first reaction, they, you know, they might knock you out, like you're trying to, you're trying to play a game, but their, their reaction, the way their body responds with the, the malakat that they've developed in their soul, is such that the first response is a fight. Other people know they might run. What happens is akhlaqi traits, first they start out as halat, they're states that we have. If we keep working, they become malakat. They become fixed parts of our character. Right? It's a reaction. Okay? 
reaction. So what happens is that sometimes when people are surprised, when they're put in a strange situation, that natural reaction comes out. Yusuf is put in a situation he would have never expected, and his natural reaction is Ma'adhallah. Ma'adhallah. God forbid. What? God forbid. Now, this, this actually is important, right? Allah Ta'ala Ta'ala stops here and he talks about what this statement means. Because he was so um, in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he had reached such a, such a state of fana fillah, right? That he, was, he had forgotten even himself, right? In his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't say in the verse, I seek refuge with Allah. That I seek refuge with Allah. His first reaction was ma'adullah, nothing but God, God forbid. Not that, let me give you another example. Another example. Hazrat Maryam, alayhi salam, also achieved a lofty station of spirituality, of tawheed and oneness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Chosen over all of the women of the world, right? Except for Hazrat Fatim. She was chosen over the women of her time. She achieved a state that she could communicate with the angels. The angels came to her. She's communicating with the angels. She's speaking and talking to angels. That's not a small thing. She was also surprised by one of the angels. One of the angels came into her private chambers, Angel Jibrail, in the form of a well-developed man. Over there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala records what happens, her conversation, her initial reaction. What does she say? This is in Surah 19 and verse number 18. قَالَتْ إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِالرَّحْمَانِ مِنْكَ إِنْ كُنْتَ تَقِيَّةً I seek refuge with Ar-Rahman from you if you are someone who has taqwa. I seek refuge. I seek refuge. Lofty, she's in a uh, strange position, she seek refuge. Yusuf alayhi salam didn't say I. Even higher than the stage, stage of Maryam, more engrossed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than even Hazrat Maryam. Doesn't say, I seek refuge with Allah, forgot about himself. Ma'adallah. Then he says something else. And again, this shows us the stage of Tawheed that Yusuf alayhi salam had achieved. One of the stages of spirituality that we're trying to work to, inshallah, we can all get to this stage is the stage where we realize that there is, what we say in Farsi, we call Tawheed Af'ali. That all actions that take place in the universe are actually the actions of God. Other people are doing things, but no one can do anything without the power of God, right? لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي الذين <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given everybody their power, their strength, and then because of that strength that Allah has given them, they act. The person, if they can reach a very lofty, first of all, to understand it intellectually, that when it comes to the actions of others, I'm not afraid of anything. Because it's all God doing it. I'm never focused on this particular individual. I see the hand of God at work in everything. Someone who realizes this, who feels this, will reach what we call itminan. I'm not worried about anything. God is handling everything. Even the actions others are doing are in reality the actions of God. Let's look at the words of, of Yusuf. This is again in the same verse. He says, Innahu Rabbi Ahsana Mathwai. Surely he. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbi is my Lord, Ahsana Mathwai. He's honored my place. He's given me an honorable place. Ahsana Mathwai. He's given me a good abode. So what happened was, remember I said in the beginning of the verse, in verse number 21, Pharaoh, it's not Pharaoh, sorry, the Aziz told his wife to honor him. Akrimi Mathwa. To look after Yusuf, to honor Yusuf, take care of Yusuf, make sure he doesn't need anything, right? Yusuf alayhi salam, the actual action of being honored and taken care of and being provided for and every need being looked out is actually being carried out by who? Zulaikha. Zulaikha is carrying out all of those things. Yusuf alayhi salam, the state that he's reached spiritually, he's attributing Zulaikha's actions 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Innahu Rabbi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my Lord. Ahsana mathwai. That he's taken care of me. He's looked out for me. He's helped me. He's assisted me. Instead of being fooled by the apparent realities of the dunya, Yusuf has reached a state where he sees even the actions of others as being in reality the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there's a point that Allah Tabatabai makes about this, the words that he chose. Right? Yusuf alayhi salam chose the words. He said, Ahsana. He didn't say, Akrama. Right? Ak- ikram means to honor. Ikram means to honor. Ihsan, this is from Allah Tabatabai. He says, Ihsan is to show kindness. Ihsan is to show kindness. Ikram is to show honor and prestige and take care of somebody and look after. What Allah Tabatabai says about this particular part. He says that, Yusuf alayhi salam, when his answer, he observes the etiquette of an abd, of a slave. If Yusuf, this is from Allah Tabatabai, if Yusuf has said, my Lord, akrama mathwai, that my Lord has honored me, it would be to say that he is somebody. He is a personality. God has honored me. God's looked after me. He doesn't say that. It's from Allah Tabatabai. He says, he says, God did ihsan to me. God showed kindness to me. I'm nobody. Who am I to God to honor? Or to No, I'm just, I'm nobody. God was kind to me. God was nice to me. I'm not somebody who's so important that I can be honored by. Who am I? One lesson that we learn, one lesson that we learn, in Islamic spirituality, the greater the person is, the closer the person gets to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the better a relationship they have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more they've done, the less they think of themselves. They don't see themselves as being anything. They're dirt, less than dirt. The true Arafa, Maraj, inshallah, you guys will get a chance to go to Qum, inshallah. Anybody, inshallah, Allah, except from this gathering, anybody who has the desire to go and make ziyara, go and make ziyara, inshallah. In addition to going to Qum and seeing Hazrat Ma'asumma and the ziyara over there, if you get a chance to meet some of these special ulama, you see people that, you heard dreams about, you heard stories about the people like Ayatollah Bashan. You'd be surprised with some of these maja, how humble they are. It's hard to believe when you hear, this guy is actually one of the, the great orafa. He's, he's just so humble, so normal, so down to earth. It's hard to believe. And those who work on themselves, those who better themselves, those who become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more good they do, the less they think of themselves. Whatever tawfiq they have is tawfiq from Allah. None of it is me and I'm so good and I've done so much. Yes, as a mu'min, you're grateful to Allah for the tawfiq to do good, but to think that I am somebody. Let me give you one story. Because this is really important for the soldiers of the Mahdi. Really sorry. There's a verse of Quran. Verse of Quran. Surah 5 and verse number 54. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Ya ayyuhal ladheena aman, O you who believe, مَنْ يَرْتَدَّ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ دِينِهِ Whoever leaves his religion, فَسَوْفَ يَعْتِ اللَّهِ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهِ If you leave your religion, don't think that Allah's religion will fail. You don't want to serve the cause, you don't want to serve the mati. You meaning myself. I don't want to do what my responsibility is. Don't think that Allah's cause will fail. He depends on us. He'll bring another group of people. He loves them and they love him. Then he says this trait about them, this sifat about them. He says, أَذِلَّةٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَعِزَّةٍ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ These individuals, these people who will carry the message, who will be the soldiers of the Imam, one of their traits is they're very humble towards the believers. They're stern with the enemies of God, but they're very humble towards the believers. I want to give you a true story about one of the shuhada, a man named Mahdi Baqiri. Mahdi Baqiri, they said that he came once, he's the commander of the base, Commander of the base, very young man, he's the commander of the base. So he goes over to check and there's outdoor showers that they set up for their brothers on the battlefield. Areas which have been built, stalls, shower stalls, they're out there. As the commander of the base, he goes over to check and make sure those shower stalls, they're all hygienic and clean and everything's correct. So he goes over. There was an older gentleman, an older Basiji, a very nice guy, always tried to serve the Basiji in every way. He sees that 
This young man has come over and he's looking inside the shower stalls. Going up to one of them, looking, checking, and we'll see what's inside it. Go to the next one, checking, looking. He says, young man, what are you doing? Talking to the commander of the base. What are you doing? Well, are you not waiting your turn like everybody else? Everybody else, they need to get in line. And he says, no, you come. He takes his hand, the commander of the entire base. Takes his hand, brings him to the end of the line, and he starts admonishing him. Young man, you're a good Basiji. You wait your turn like everybody else. They're all Basijis. You wait your turn like everybody else. He talks to him. He says that in Farsi, they say the word father is pedar. He says, pedar, John. Old guy, right? Father, look, I, I'm not trying to use the bathroom or use the shower. I just want to... He realizes the old guy isn't, doesn't understand what he's talking. The old guy's taking his hand. Young man, go back to the end of the line. So he's over there. Now he's standing in the end of the line. He wants to go check the bathroom. He's standing in the end of the line. He's in the end of the line. Waiting his turn. One of the other Basijis recognizes this is the commander of the entire base. Mehdi Bakht. He goes over to the old guy. Takes him aside. The guy you put in the end of the line there, that's Mehdi Bakri. The old guy comes over. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I must. He said, no. You did, your, you did your responsibility. Kisses the man. The closer you get to God, the more you work on the self, the less egos involved. This nafs is involved. We ask that Allah give us this, and inshallah we're able to work on ourselves, and we're able to become those people, who become the true soldiers of the Imam. The more they do, the less ego is there. Back to the story. Innahu la yuflihu dhalimun. Yusuf salam continues in his statement. So first, God forbid. Secondly, um, <coughs> my Lord has taken care of me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored me, has looked out for me. And then finally he says that um, the oppressors are not successful. The oppressors. What happens is that in the Islamic understanding, sins, like fornication, like other sins, are dhulm and oppression. Oppression to others sometimes, and other times oppression to ourselves. Even akhlaqi traits are things we want to be careful about. As the soldiers of the Mahdi, we're trying to make sure that we are not committing any sort of ma'asi in our lives. There's no sort of sins or anything that we're doing. In addition to that, we're also working so that the akhlaqi traits, we don't have any negative akhlaqi traits in ourselves. So a couple of things that... So this is different, obviously, from the way the West sees sin. The way the West, they, you know, it's freedom. Do what you want to do. You have it, flaunt it. Huh? You have it, flaunt it. Do whatever you want. You're free. Different from the Islamic point of view of saying that this is actually dhulm. Remember that story of Bushr and Imam al Qadim alayhi salatu wa salam? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. That the Imam, he was walking in the streets. When he's walking in the streets, then there's a house, and they're playing a lot of music, and things are going on, and haram, muharramat in the house. The imam's passing. When he's passing, a girl who works in the house comes out of the house. Dump some garbage or whatever, comes out of the house. And the imam asks the girl, he says, is the man who owns this house, is he free or a slave? Is he an abd or is he hur? Free. And the girl says, No, obviously he's free. He's a big guy. He has many slaves. He's a he's not an abd. He's not an abd. And the mom said, Yeah, it's obvious he's not an abd. An abd wouldn't behave like this. And he goes. The girl goes back to the house. She spent a little time outside. Horus over there, a Bursar who's actually drinking alcohol at this time. What happened? Why are you delayed? So I met a gentleman in the street. And he said that, is the owner of this house an abd or is he hor and free? And Bushra realized, this kind of lifestyle, that's not what I'm supposed to be living. As a Muslim, I'm free from God. I don't obey his things. No, the relationship that we have, love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is being a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how we express our love. In kuntum, to Allah, If you love Allah, obey me. 
obey the Prophet. Being an Abd, submitting. The other lifestyle is dhulm in Islam. Dhulm to the self. God doesn't get hurt by my sins. If I commit sins to the... If everyone on the face of the earth did kufr, Allah doesn't need any of us, that he gets... He benefits from our prayers. He doesn't need our prayers. We could all do dhulm and kufr and everything. Go about our business. None of that would have any effect on God. God doesn't benefit by our actions. We benefit. We're the beneficiaries. We need these instructions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our souls need to be told these things. We need to submit, both from making sure we have correct beliefs, and then after that, correct actions, and after that, that the states of the heart are those correct states of the heart. So let's get one last lesson from the actual verse. قَالَ مَعَاذَ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ رَبِّي أَحْسَنَ مَثْوَاهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ Yusuf salam said, God forbid, he's my Lord. He's been kind to me. And the oppressors are not successful. One point that we get from this is that when it comes to situations, part of the reason we have spiritual casualties, and I'm talking about myself, is not necessarily the case that I want to violate Allah's laws. I want to do wrong. I want to do haram. I want to be far from my Lord. But because of social pressure, because of the, pe- the company I keep, the people I'm around, the suggestions they make, I don't want to look bad, I don't want to look small, these things can lead to one, making mistakes. At whatever level we are in our own spiritual development, making mistakes, the company keeps. What we, The lesson we want to learn is the same thing that Hazrat Yusuf did. When it came to the suggestion of sin, he was very firm in rejecting it. Ma'adhullah. No leniency, no smiling, no let's be soft. Immediately he took that harsh stance when it came to sin and violating Allah's laws. And we don't want to make the mistake of because we're being lenient, get caught up in a situation where we're actually unhappy with the results. We end up for farther away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me give you one story from a middle mu'mineen. Ali alayhi salatu wa salam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It was the eighth year of Hijrah. The eighth year of Hijrah, and the Prophet ﷺ went to Hajj for the last time. Now, Amirul Mu'minin was in Yemen at that time. In Yemen. And he had been sent to teach the people Islam and to collect zakat and these things to help the people. He heard that the Prophet had left for Mecca and he rushed to get over to meet the Prophet. Now, he had an army that was coming with him. He was in charge of a group of Mu'minin army, they're coming with him. Amir al-Mu'mineen goes ahead to go over and meet the Prophet in Mecca. He puts somebody else in charge of the army, the group that was over there. What these individuals did is among the things they were carrying to the Prophet, among the Baytul Mal, were these wonderful Yemeni outfits. Wonderful Yemeni outfits. What the people did was that they put on the Yemeni outfits, the nice Yemeni brocade, whatever it was, put it on. And they said, what we'll do is we'll meet the Prophet wearing these wonderful clothes. We'll do ihram like this, and we'll go and we're wearing this thing. But it's Baytul Mal. Amir al-Mu'mineen came back to his group. When he came back to the group, he sees everybody's wearing the Baytul Mal, the wonderful Yemeni outfits. He says, what is it that you guys are doing? Who gave you permission? That He's questioning the guy who he placed in charge. You told these guys they can... He said, they told me they were going to do the, make ihram and these things. And after that, we take it back, we give it to the Prophet. You can't do that with Baytul Mal. He snatched the outfits off. Give me those things back. Put them. Right? And probably from some of the people, probably had to snatch it by force, Amir al-Mu'mini. Amir al-Mu'mini didn't play. Baytul Mal, Amir al-Mu'mini took that. And the people came to Mecca. And they came to the presence of the Prophet. And they were upset about this. See this Amir al-Mu'mineen? When it comes to the laws of God, this is how he... Complaining. And the Prophet said this sentence, Irfa'u al-sinatakum an Ali ibn Abi Talib. Stop complaining and stop talking about Ali ibn Abi Talib. فَإِنَّهُ خَشَنٌ فِذَاتِ اللَّهِ When it comes to the laws of God, ma'asiya, violating Allah's laws, Amir al-Mu'mineen doesn't play with anybody. 
Serious. This is how it is. So even when it comes to the suggestion of sin, the soldiers of the Mahdi have to be strong enough to say absolutely not. We ask Allah by the right of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad to make us amongst the soldiers of the Mahdi. We ask Allah by the right of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad to accept what was said and heard in his way. We ask Allah by the right of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad to protect all of the mu'mineen and mu'minat, all of the maraja and especially the leader. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah. 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 Allah.